All right, hello everybody. Thank you very much for being here at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. My name is Stephen Fagan. I'm the curator here. And you're joining us for a special program that we call Living History, where we invite someone to the museum who lived the experience of the Kennedy assassination to share their story with us. We have an active and ongoing oral history project at this museum where we have interviewed more than 1,500 people about where they were and what they experienced that weekend and in the 1960s. And this type of program is a chance to bring one of our oral history voices in front of a group and let you guys become oral historians later on today. We're going to chat for about half an hour about uh, his experiences that weekend, and then I'm going to turn it over to you guys, and you'll be able to ask questions, and everything's being recorded today for the oral history collection here at the museum and for our YouTube channel. Our guest today was a Dallas police officer for 30 years, and uh, he was an officer at the time of the Kennedy assassination. His name is W.E. Rusty Robbins. Please join me in welcoming Rusty to the museum today to share his story with us. Hello. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and share my story as best I can. Uh, I'll try to remember. It's been 50 years ago, and you see I'm not working from notes. No. Some things are so embedded in your mind that you can talk about it without notes. That's right. We're going to put a picture of uh, you on the screen right here. This is a very dramatic photograph because this is at Parkland Memorial Hospital on the day that Lee Harvey Oswald was shot, Sunday, November 24th. And you can actually see Oswald's body on a stretcher there being taken to the morgue. And the officer holding the shotgun in the background of this photograph is the man that is sitting in front of you, Rusty Robbins. So that's what he looked like back in 1963. Uh, but, but Rusty, I want to start our story a little further back because you joined the Dallas Police Department in 1956. That's correct. And after training, you worked in traffic for a little while like most of the rookies do. All the rookies had to go down in traffic because Dallas traffic was a mess. That was before any, any of the freeways were opened or built and everybody went through town, whichever direction they were going, they had to pass through downtown Dallas. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was a real mess even with the help of probably 40 or 50 policemen directing traffic. In this photograph, you can see a policeman in the intersection there, but look at those cars and look at the far back of the picture. That is a uh, traffic jam backed up as far as the eye can see there uh, in downtown Dallas. And of course, we take it for granted these days, back in the late 50s and early 60s, there weren't the shopping malls, there weren't all of the okay. attractions and activities in the suburbs to attract no. people. Everything, down, everything was downtown. Downtown was the hub, uh -huh. the movie theaters, the restaurants, everything well, you, was downtown. You mentioned movie theaters, there was 14 movie theaters on Elm Street, <laughs> and no movie theaters on any other street downtown. For some reason, they all got in a row there. Wow. If you didn't like what you saw, you just walked to the next one and looked at it, and you're bound to find something you like. Yeah. Let's look at some of the vehicles from those days. Here we see a uh, Dallas three-wheeler motorcycle along with a Dallas police uh, vehicle. Now, you moved, from, you moved into patrol. Tell us a little bit about your work as a Dallas patrolman. Well, as a patrolman, it is so varied that I don't really know where to start except you go to work every day not knowing what you're going to be involved in. And if you're the kind of person who you belong in that profession, you're excited about it, you're looking forward to it, you never know what your next call is going to be. Uh, if you like to watch cops on television, that's a good example of what we did back then and they will be doing for years and years to come. Uh, any kind of situation, you step into it and you're expected to handle it. Mm -hmm. It might be relevant here in 2016 to talk a little bit about when you were a police officer back in the late 50s and early 60s about race relations in Dallas. This was still a time when certain parts of Dallas, certain restaurants and stores were still segregated. As a, as a police officer, how did you navigate that? I never came into a situation that uh, involved race relations because from my standpoint, it was, uh, it was good. Uh, I, there are no race rights anywhere that I was involved in. Uh, there, there was uh, places that, well, I'm not sure how to, how to explain this. People pretty much went to where they knew they were welcome. Mm. And because of that, there was no problems that I was aware of. The, the, the blacks went to their community and the whites didn't go there. They went to a different community. 
So I just never ran into it personally. Things were sort of changing in that era, and we would they see were. a lot of, of, of strife and uncertainty in the years ahead, but yeah. uh, that's, that's what you remember from the early uh, 1960s. Yeah. Speaking of the early 1960s, in this photograph we see President and Mrs. Kennedy at Dallas Love Field that morning. Now, you got to work their visit. Uh, were you concerned at all uh, about their safety, about the President's safety when he was visiting Dallas? Never crossed my mind, no. It was my understanding that Chief Curry, who was chief at that time, had put on double the protection from Dallas PD that had been requested by the president's staff, the Secret Service people. So I, I was aware of that. I thought, well, we're going to be doing a super good job. There shouldn't be anything happening. But there was. Other dignitaries had visited Dallas in the past, and it was not uncommon for someone to travel in an open car through the downtown streets. No problem. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. Now, your assignment that day put you on Main Street, and here we see a picture of Main Street. This was taken from the Adolphus Hotel on Main, and you see a crowd of people, about eight or ten people thick, and your job was crowd control. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, <clears throat> I think the, the plan here is crowd control really means presence of police, and if you see officers around, you don't do the wrong things. Um, if someone had tried something, of course, we would have gotten involved with that. If they'd run to the, to the president's car, any, of, any one of us officers would have run out there and taken control of the person, assuming we could. Uh, but I just didn't think anything was going to happen. I guess I was naive. Mm -hmm. You were, I think, around the 1800 block? That's correct. Or about where Teich's department store was. Yes, not there now. Yeah, and in the pictures we're looking at, is, is that the way the crowd looked to you, or was it bigger or smaller where you were? I thought it was a little smaller than some of these pictures I've seen. So we don't know exactly where all these pictures were taken. Mm -hmm. But where I was, I just remembered it years, as we, years later that it wasn't quite that many people. Mm -hmm. And they dispersed immediately. There's no problem. The officer, this is not you, but the officer doing crowd control in this picture, is that pretty much what you were doing that day with a whistle in your hand and just keeping that's, people back? That's right. I know the man. Oh, okay. I uh, can't think of his name, but I know him. <laughs> One of, of, <coughs> of many, many officers doing crowd control that day. Uh -huh. And let's look at this picture. Here comes the presidential motorcade down Main Street. And again, look at that sea of people. Uh, did you get a chance to see the, the president? Where, what were, where were your eyes when he was passing by? I will admit, my eyes were on the crowd. But I sneaked a look as he was coming, <laughs> and I sneaked a look if he went by. Because while I'm sneaking looks, I'm also looking at the crowd, too. Your, your back is to the car. You're, you're facing yes. the crowd. So uh -huh. the, car, the President of the United States is literally going right behind your back. That's correct. I would have snuck a peek, too. I snuck I have a to peek. Tell you. I sure did. Let's look at a close-up here. Here's the parade. And you can just see how close. Look at those people on the, the uh, left-hand side of the car, just how close they are to Mrs. Kennedy uh, in that vehicle. Did it feel like there was, it was claustrophobic, not a lot of room for the no. car to pass? No. Where I was, they were standing on the curb and not too thick back. Now, this picture here had to have been taken somewhere else further down the route mm -hmm. where the public was uh, thicker. Right. Any, uh, any incidents? Did you have anybody along that area of, of Main Street that tried to get out a little too far? No, they heard I was there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> did, uh, did you talk to any of the people in the crowd? Do you remember any details about that? I can't say that I remember anything about it except I went there and did what I was supposed to do and snuck a peek. Okay. And everything went smooth and my day was over. I brought in for overtime for that and uh, an extra pay of four hours, which, man, I needed the money. Yeah. And I went to the locker room then. My job was over. Let's look at when the crowd dispersed. This is another one of those extraordinary pictures like that traffic jam. Look at the sea of people as far as the eye can see, and this is just people taking to the streets after the parade passed their location. Did you get caught up in this? Never saw it. Okay. Never heard about it. <laughs> well, there's a photograph proving that it did happen, but you avoided all of this, went back to police headquarters, and that's when you found out what had happened right here in this uh -huh. building in Dealey Plaza. Uh -huh. How did you find out? That man named Osborne right there. I know him. The, uh, He's probably dead. The officer right here? Uh-huh. How do you recognize him from the back? Well, he's a big man. They called him the Big O. 
Okay. Osborne. Osborne. Well, that's good to know. I don't All right. Know. Well, I, just, I just know who that is. <laughs> well, pick up the story here. Uh, how did you find out about the shooting in the plaza? Well, I was in the midst of changing out of my uniform back into civilian clothes, and somebody came running through. The president's been shot. Well, cops are cold-blooded and jokers. I didn't take it to be truth at first, but I walked around the other part of the locker room. Sure enough, everybody else was believing it, so I did too. I immediately started putting my, ra my uniform back on because I, I knew I was going to be needed to do something. And I went to our headquarters, our office, and that's when I was approached by one of the supervisors there who gave me an assignment. He said, I need you to, uh, and I guess Sam Soresby was in there at the same time because he sent both of us to go get a car at the police department, or at the uh, police garage, and report to Sergeant so-and-so out at the police morgue. And we did that. We went as fast as we could go out there and, and report. found that morgue at Markland, Parkland. But that's, that's Sunday. Let's go back to Friday because you went to the Sheridan Hotel first. Oh, Friday. Yeah, Friday, okay. the day of the assassination. Hey, pardon me. I get my... That's I okay. Get, we're going to get there. And you know, you, it's a preview of coming attractions. <coughs> but, but Friday, you were sent out to the Sheridan Hotel. Um, yes. When I went to the office upstairs, I was told to go to the Sheridan Hotel, room number something, which is a very tall number. I, I assumed it was at the very top of the hotel. And uh, I was told that this is where the president's communication center is, right. and that he can speak to anyone all over the whole world from, the, from that room. Let, let me just interject here. Back in the early 1960s, whenever the president would travel, uh, an organization called the White House Communications Agency would basically set up a hub of operations uh, so that the president could have sort of international communications at this time. And they sent you out to the Sheraton where the White House Communications Agency was set up. That was my understanding. And I went to room number so-and-so up on the upper floor, knocked on the door. It opened up about so much. And a man says, can I help you? And I told him I was there to be of any help I could be. And he says, we're kind of crowded in the room right now, if you, as you would imagine. If I bring you a chair, can you sit outside? So I was agreeable to that. <clears throat> and I sat there in the chair that he had provided me with. I guess not long, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. The man came back out and he said, do you have a car? And I said, yes. Can you take me to Love Field? I need to get on Air Force One. Well, I had to think about that for a second or two, and I didn't know why I couldn't, so I agreed. He came back out in a few minutes pulling two carts, equipment carts, and I didn't know what was in them. Could have been uh, uh, communication devices. Could have been his laundry. I don't know. But we went downstairs as quick as we could, loaded those things in the trunk of my unmarked police car, and we headed for Love Field as fast as I could go. I knew he was in a hurry, so I was whipping in and out. And he said, uh, are you allowed to use the siren? Yeah. Can you? Would you? And I said, yeah. So I flipped on the switches. Now, back then, we had to operate the switch manually, the siren. Oh, oh. If you didn't get on that, you didn't get any sound. Things are different now. That's the same you pull out a switch and you change it from the horn button to the siren button. Kind of antique operation. Well, I went as fast as I could go through the traffic. Oh, making lots of noise. But you have to understand the siren's under the hood. And it makes you feel like the whole world can hear you. And all it's doing is filling your ears with noise. So you have to take that in consideration. And I'm whipping in and out of traffic. And this man with me, he slid forward in his seat. Got his feet up on the dash which is the way we rode back then because we didn't have safety belts. They had not been invented. And I said, I see you've done this before. And he said, all over the town, all over the world. Uh, here we go. So I knew he had been all, all over the world doing wild things, and I gave him a wild ride out to, <laughs> out to uh, get on Air Force One. Well, we got to Love Field, and just as we were going up the main entrance, he noticed over on our right, was Air Force One coming down a, a taxiway, and he recognized that it's too late. I missed it. He said, take me to the front door, and I'll catch a commercial flight. And that's what I did. I took him to the front door of, of uh, 
Love Field. We didn't have DFW at that time. We're talking 50 years ago. Uh, he jumped out, he thanked me, and took off. Now, I would love to be able to tell you who that man was. I could make up some kind of wild tale about it, but I just don't know. I just stick with the facts as I know them. So I went back to headquarters, having completed that little assignment, stood around for a little while, and they didn't need me for anything. They sent me home since I was on the payroll, send him home. And that was my day as it ended. Let's talk about one more aspect of that day. One of Dallas's finest, Officer J.D. Tippett, was also shot and killed that day. Yes. And you knew Officer Tippett. I did. Tell me about what you remember about J.D. Tippett. Slow talking, easy going, salt of the earth. Uh, from what all that I could gather from people that did know him, I worked at the same station for a while that he did on opposite shifts. Each station had three shifts. He was on one. I was on a different one. And I saw him in the locker room. I saw him all around. I saw him horse playing with others. I saw that people slap him on the back. How are you doing? So my impression of J.D. Tippett was he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. I did not work with him. I did not know him personally. Let's talk about the impact because this is happening in Dallas, but it's, a, it's an event of international significance. This is affecting the entire world, the death of President Kennedy. Would you say that the death of President Kennedy had an emotional impact? And at the same time, would you say that the loss of, of one of your own officers, Tippett, was even more impactful than the death of the President of the United States? Well, I shouldn't say it, but the loss of the fellow officer was greater than that of the President. And, and I just wrote that involved in politics. And I was sorry that man, any man, died. But I knew we'd have another president and things would keep going. Uh, but we'd never have another J.D. Tippett. Hmm. Did you recognize in the midst of all of this, driving to Love Field uh, after the assassination, did you think that you were participating in an event that would be of, of considerable historic significance, that you'd be in a museum talking about it half a century later? No, this has turned into something I never expected. Uh, not, I don't know what to say about that. It, it, it's grown into something I wasn't looking for. The next day, Saturday, November 23rd, you worked a typical evening shift, and we're looking yeah. at a picture of the third floor of Dallas Police Headquarters here, which oh, was a mess. Uh, 300 members of the world press, it was estimated, crowded those corridors. Uh, what was that like for you? to? You weren't even involved in the assassination investigation. You were just working a normal shift, but what was it like to go through hallways like that? Well, I tried to avoid that kind of a hallway. If I were to catch somebody who was involved in a burglary, I had to take them through that hallway to, to the burger and theft office where I would subsequently work later. But uh, I, I saw that and stayed away from it. As, as luck would have it, I did not have any situation that would force me to go down that hallway. Mm -hmm. But I knew it existed. Yeah. It was a mess. You stay away from it. Let's jump ahead to Sunday. Lee Harvey Oswald is shot by nightclub owner Jack Ruby. We'll come back to Ruby in a few okay. minutes, but let's start with Oswald. <clears throat> Here is Oswald arriving at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Like millions of other Americans, you see the shooting on television, yeah. but uh, you have a pretty unique story. Where were you sent by the Dallas Police Department after the shooting of Oswald? Well, having seen it on my little 10-inch television at home uh, three or four, about four or five times, because it was replayed all the time, I hurriedly got dressed and reported to duty. And I went to my headquarters office and was sent to the morgue uh, to contact whoever was supervisor there, which I did along with another officer named, uh, uh, what's his name? I've forgotten. You know his name. The officer that I went with. Oh, yes. His name is escaping me at the moment because you always tell me. But uh, it'll, okay. it'll come to us in it'll just a moment. It'll come to us. Forgive me for 50 years of it's memory okay. loss. We'll see a picture of him in just a second. Yeah. Well, he and I got a car and went out to Parkland, and we did locate the morgue. The, the, the morgue had a sign on the door, morgue, mm -hmm. so we could find that. Knocked on the door, and this sergeant came out, and, and uh, a sergeant who I knew at the time. I have some pictures. Let's look at those real quick. First of all, okay. your action pose. Yeah. Here you are with your shotgun running across the parking lot into Parkland. This is a great picture of you. And we then catch up with you inside in the doorway here, and you're waiting for Oswald's body to be brought down 
yes. to the morgue here. And a lot of photographers are there by this time, so we've got lots of pictures from lots of different angles. So as you tell the story, I'm going to go through some of these pictures and we'll take a look at where you are. There you are on the far right on uh -huh. this side, and you can see <clears throat> Oswald's body at the end of that corridor. On a sort gurney. Of, yeah, sort of dimly lit corridor coming towards you. So you remember, take us back to this scene that we're seeing in this picture. What was happening? Well, by this time, we had been told by supervisors that they were fearful, uh, the police department in general was fearful that, uh, that a mob could come and take his body and maybe have set it afire, who knows what, uh, overpower the protection that we had there. So we were on our toes at this time. <clears throat> and as you can see, I'm still port arms with a shotgun. Yeah, in uh, all these pictures, you're holding that shotgun pretty tightly. Yeah. Uh, we, we had been alerted that things could happen any moment now. People were that angry in the aftermath of the assassination that there was genuine concern that Oswald's body would be taken away. I didn't know that, but the supervisors, the people who knew more about it than I, had been around longer than I, they were telling us this could mm -hmm. happen. And y'all are part of the group to not let it happen. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. You have a job to do, so you're guarding that door with your life. And uh -huh. in this picture, we can just see your hands and the shotgun and just a tiny bit of your face, but this is taken from the opposite side of right. that last photograph. Again, photographers all around you taking pictures in uh, different, different perspectives of the same moment in history. Um, now, after this is taken, the door shuts, the body's inside the morgue. The photographers are talking to you. Are they, are they uh, being friendly to you? Are they making you offers? What, what's happening? We were standing outside the door. Uh, after a little while, we kind of relaxed. And uh, we were having a friendly chat with everybody who was being friendly. Uh, some of those photographers had cameras with lenses that long. They had bags this big full of flash bulbs. Back then, they couldn't use a flash bulb but one time. And they had to find a place to get rid of it, usually on the ground. And there, there was probably 12 or 15 photographers out there from every known magazine and, and big newspaper in the world were there. We still have life around. Uh, and I can't even begin to name all the magazines that were there at that time, but now they're gone. <clears throat> but it was a friendly atmosphere. In, in fact, we got a little sloppy with our guns and put them down or and one guy kind of eased out there and was getting ready to snap a picture. And another photographer jumped in with him. Hey, man, don't do that. So Sam Soresby. There you go. Sam and I. I put, knew it would come. We, we took a pose and to look like we're official and doing, know what we're doing. And that's what you see. That's uh, the picture that we're looking at here. Uh, so yeah. sort of po they gave you a moment to compose yourself. And, and we took advantage of it. And that is you on the left-hand side looking I'm straight good, I'm ahead. I'm the good-looking one the furthest away. Exactly, exactly, looking straight ahead. And, and you do look uh, very day. I would not cross you in a, in a situation like this with you holding that gun. <laughs> but, but there were some photographers who were trying to get you to let them inside, right? Well, there were some mentions of that. How much would it? I would offer you $50. Money was smaller then. Uh, $50 was a lot of money. And uh, what they wanted to do is get a peek inside and take a picture of Oswald's body. Uh, during the autopsy. And of course, had we even wanted to, you couldn't because there's so many people standing there. But we got the offer anyway. Wow. Such an extraordinary moment for you to be caught up in. And, and there's something else. You have another very unique connection to this moment in time because of this fella <clears throat> here in police custody is Dallas nightclub owner Jack Ruby, who uh -huh. shot Oswald. You recognized Ruby immediately. Tell oh. me about that. On my 10-inch television, I saw, told to my wife, that's Jack Ruby right there. Before his name had been announced oh, sure. or anything? He's easily recognizable. Well, tell us about how you knew that was Jack Ruby. In the year prior, possibly even two years prior to the killing of JFK, I worked a beat, a police beat in uniform that had Jack Ruby's strip joint in it. There's a picture of the strip joint right there. Uh, burlesque club. Yeah. <clears throat> burlesque, okay. It was a night, Dallas nightclub. There you go. <clears throat> but we it, see Ruby on stage here, sort of working the crowd. And, and what was his reputation in Dallas? Let me back up just a second. Go for At it. this time in history, there was only three 
what did you call it, gentlemen clubs? Or something? Burlesque clubs Burlesque. in Dallas. In the entire city of Dallas. And because everything that was happening that was big in Dallas was in the downtown area, which accounts for the three being there. Mm -hmm. And Jack Ruby ran one of those three joints. And it was the sleaziest. It was the most... Uh, I'm trying to, trying to think here of the right words for it. He was not successful. It was the worst of the three. Worst of the three. Okay. Uh, the carousel club was what it was and called. And he did poorly as far as dollars coming in. I don't know why, but the other two, which we went in periodically, always had more business than his. Mm -hmm. and Jack welcomed us. Oh, he's glad to see us. Come on in. Come on. Uh, bring your wife sometime. Um, and one time I decided, to, I offered Jack Ruby to go bowling with me. It was at a place where I was working off duty part time and I could bowl free and even bring a guest. So I asked Jack, did you want to go bowling after you get to close your place? He said, sure. So I got off work, he closed his place and we went bowling. The important thing about that is not that I went bowling with Jack Ruby, but what happened afterward. Jack got a strike in about the third or fourth frame and was so excited, so thrilled that he went to the right two or three, four lanes to get somebody look up at the scoreboard. I got a strike, got a strike. And he went back to the left three or four lanes. See what I did? Jack Ruby was so wanting a claim of some sort that he had done something good, something worthwhile. And I didn't think much about that until a year or so later when he shot Oswald. My feeling is that he shot Oswald for that reason, just some public acclaim. Somebody, somebody to say, hey, look at me, what I did, that he had never been able to get that before. He needed uh, validation. That's, I'm looking at that word, validation. Yeah. Absolutely. This is a, 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 I love this picture of Jack Ruby in handcuffs here when he's in uh, Dallas County custody at the Dallas County Jail. Now, I asked you earlier, let me, let, let me revisit that. What would you say, how would you characterize Jack Ruby's reputation as a club owner in Dallas? He was likable. Um, he may have even been laughed at a little bit by some of the others because he just never could seem to make a go of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody that didn't like Jack Ruby. Uh, I guess most everybody liked him. Did you ever get the sense that he was involved in anything illegal or in the mob organized crime? Absolutely not. He welcomed police. Uh, I never heard of anybody that was involved in anything wrong dealing with Jack Ruby. Now, that's brought up a lot in the books and the movies yeah. that, that, that Jack and the police had a really good relationship and uh, most of the officers knew him. Is that true or is that exaggerated? No, that's true. Uh, because he made it a point of being friendly to the police. He passed out tickets for free entrance, bring your wife. Uh, <clears throat> he wasn't hiding anything. Mm -hmm. I've gone through his strip joint, what do you call it? Burlesque club. Burlesque club. I've walked in the back <laughs> and uh, we stood there and made little pieces in an in a oven little uh, electric oven. There's nothing in that place going on that was wrong. You made pizzas in the back room of the Carousel Club. I did. Jack, I never told you that before. That's, that's very interesting. We've spoken twice before, and I never, <laughs> never mentioned that. And, and Jack Ruby had little dogs that he was very fond of. While we're on the back room, we yeah. also insisted we have some champagne and showed us on the bottle, 100% non-alcoholic. That was to eat the pizzas with. Okay. Pizza okay. and champagne with Jack Ruby and yes, his dog. Yes, and he sold it to uh, people come into town uh, as champagne. Uh, he didn't let them. It was dark in there, and they couldn't read on the little tiny letters. It said 100%. He charged. After he closed, <laughs> after closing time, he pretended like it was illegal to sell anything alcoholic. So he served it in a coffee cup at $4.50 a coffee cup of non-alcoholic champagne. That's extraordinary, like sort of like prohibition. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but there and, were some laws in Dallas about, about selling alcohol. Uh, you had to bring your own alcohol or you had to buy a, a, a setup at a club like that? There were places like that. I, I didn't drink, so I wasn't familiar with that. And, and, uh, but Ruby liked the show. He liked the drama of it. Oh, yeah, he let on like it's a big deal and won't let you in, but if, if the police come in, just act like you're drinking coffee. 
Wow. Well, let me ask you about the dogs, because he did have some, he had some little dachshunds, Sheba. He did, and back in the kitchen again, it's where he kept his dogs. And he Sanitary. Did not, he did not take them out regularly, and he did not clean it regularly. The kitchen was a mess. All right. And you still ate that pizza? Well, the pizza was wrapped. It was frozen and wrapped, and we <laughs> ate it one of those little... Daisy, Daisy heat ovens or something. <laughs> so in, in sort of the crucible of all this, your, your experiences with Jack Ruby, how do you, I mean, does it make sense to you that this guy, Jack, that you went bowling with and had pizza with, does it make sense that he's the man who kills Lee Harvey Oswald? It does because he's seeking recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you used a word I was looking for. Validation. Validation, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, there were so many things that, that told me he would not have been the one to do that and that he couldn't have been one planning to do that. It, it should be pointed out, I don't know this, but I've read it, and I believe it to be true, that he was a block away in a uh, Western Union, Western Union mm -hmm. office sending some money to a stripper to come to Dallas. Uh, $27, I believe. He was, money was a little cheaper then. Uh, so she could come to Dallas and work for him. Uh, now, that's historical record, I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, and having learned that, it to me it further uh, suggests that he had no intentions of going and getting involved it in this. Spontaneous. He just happened to be there, and all of a sudden I can be validated. Hmm. That's interesting. <clears throat> interesting, based uh, that you came to that conclusion based on your experiences with him. That's that's what this is all about. I want to give you guys the chance to be oral historians for a moment, and since we're recording this. Uh, think about questions that people might want to know from this man a hundred years from now when all of us are gone. Uh, uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you and we'll, we'll record your question and, and Rusty's answer for you. There's no such thing as a bad question. Anybody don't rush. <laughs> Someone has to ask him if he believes Oswald acted alone or if it was a conspiracy or something like that. Yeah. I'm going to repeat the question for the cameras. <laughs> How long did it, it was a good question. How long did it take for the police department to get back to normal after all of this? I was involved in just a small segment of the police department, so I'm going to have to make a wild guess. Uh, I worked outside all the time, and I brought my prisoners, should I have one, to the basement, same place where Oswald was killed, and I know that things were not normal for at least a week. Uh, a lot of people moving around, taking pictures, interviewing people, but perhaps in a week, it could have been longer. But that's a good question. Yes? Do you think anyone's ever considered that maybe Ruby and Oswald working together because Oswald didn't want her out in jail for what he did, so he killed her on purpose? The question was the possibility that Lee R. V. Oswald and Jack Ruby were working together. No, absolutely not. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are we to assume that after all these years that when people ask you today what you believe, you believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, Jack Ruby acted alone, no conspiracy? I believe Ruby acted alone. I've heard a number of uh, other thoughts on Oswald. I'm open on some of them. Uh, some foreign government may, may have paid him, I don't know. And I can't uh, uh, number all the different, line up all the different factions that might have had some. So I'm a little open on him. Jack Ruby, I'm solid on. Okay. He's just a nut. There you go. Questions for Rusty Robbins. Yeah. Did you ever get threatened? Like, did you ever get threatened during this time? Were you ever threatened during this time? Not about that. <laughs> Nothing relating to this Kennedy assassination. Uh, I, I moved on in, my, in the department eventually, and as a detective, uh, I made life miserable for some people, and there were some threats relating to that. Mm -hmm. But not about the assassination. Not about the assassination. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Was crime worse after the assassination in Dallas? I can't answer that. I don't know. I, but I don't know why it would have been. Mm -hmm. um, maybe she has some idea on her mind why she thinks it might have been. But I, I don't have that. 
It's interesting, though. You, you, you're, you're thinking that perhaps it did get worse after the assassination since the president had been killed. Is that what you were thinking? It makes sense. That's a reasonable uh, conclusion someone might draw. Uh, it also could draw the opposite, that, that the, the criminal sort of went underground after the assassination. Mm-hmm. But you don't have any personal perspective on that? Not really, no. I'm not a good at, not good at making up answers. That's okay. I just talk no, about we don't what like I, to make stuff know. up. Go ahead, yes, ma'am. Did you ever get the sense that when you knew Ruby that he was capable of committing a crime like this? Yeah, uh, he had been, he had a, a reputation back in, uh, and I didn't learn this so much until later. I kind of learned a little bit about it before the assassination. But his reputation was pretty scrappy. So I can imagine him getting involved in something that he could be violent. Mm -hmm. But uh, it just wasn't his nature all the time. Every time I saw him, he was happy. Hmm. Now, I knew that he had a a temper that affected some. There was an incident, I don't remember it, but he got all upset uh, over one of his strippers not showing up right and threw a big fit, notable. no, I would have thought the man's calm most of the time. You never saw any of these outbursts. You heard no, about no. them, but you didn't witness it, them. It was only told to me, mm-hmm. outbursts, things he had uh, said that might show he could be violent, angry. Now, now, the Dallas police came under a great deal of criticism after the assassination uh-huh. for the way everything was handled, particularly the fact that Oswald was killed in their custody in their basement. How did you feel? Were you sensitive about that kind of criticism? I don't remember my feelings because I just wasn't involved that much. I report to work and go to my district and do my job and pick up my drunks or whatever. Uh, so I really don't know about that. Okay. Any other questions? In the far back, yes. Did you think after people figured out about the assassination that they were trying to sort of outbreak like Now, were you worried about other crimes like Ruby's, uh, like copycats? Is that what you're talking about? Like copycat crimes like Jack Ruby's after that, after Oswald was shot? Well, I hate to admit it, but I was young and dumb, even at 27. <laughs> Sometimes you can be young and dumb about some things on, on up through the years. And I was just not involved that much in, in what was going on in the city. Mm-hmm. I was doing my job. And if, there, if I ever thought that, I don't remember it. Uh, Murders like this were handled by the homicide and robbery detectives under Captain Will Fritz. And so you were a uh, patrolman. patrolman. So you you were in the patrol division, which was different. Okay. Yeah. So he wouldn't have been involved in the actual murder investigation, but uh, certainly caught up in the events as a patrolman. Yes. About Ruby's access to the basement. Yeah, that that is that has been, how did how did Jack Ruby get access to the basement to be able to shoot? That's been tossed back and forth about. Yeah, quite a bit. Now he claimed that he walked a half a block from Western Union down and got to where the driveway goes down and just walked right on down it. Mm-hmm. And on then down at the bottom, that's where he stood with a group of people till he got the opportunity to shoot Oswald. I have no personal knowledge about that. I just know what he claimed. And there was a supervisor over a group of officers at the top of that ramp to make sure that nobody came down it. There was a supervisor and at least two patrolmen. They were having to stop traffic to let cars come up that ramp the wrong way. And and cars were going down the ramp if they had a prisoner to go to jail or other business. So they were working traffic up and down that ramp. The supervisor over that has gone before the, uh, was it the Warren Commission that was doing this? Uh, And he's testified that nobody went down that ramp. Okay. I know him. He's a fine guy. But I tend to believe Jack Ruby. I think what happened is everybody got their, their attention diverted to something, and Jack just turned and walked down the ramp. Yeah. That's what Jack says. I believe it. It's it's continued. To, it's discussed and debate debated quite a bit about how Ruby got in there and whether he had help or whether he was knowingly allowed access. I think that's the real key was whether the Dallas police were sort of the both charge of, that they both were assisting. Both of them are Ruby. dead. Yeah, Ruby and the sergeant, 
whose name escapes me, but uh, well, uh, that Roy Vaughn was at the Roy top of the Vaughn. ramp. <laughs> you, you're a miracle. Uh, you can always. Well, I couldn't remember, remember Sam Sorsby, so we were one and one. So I don't know how you keep good. up with this. <laughs> um, we'll have time for one more question. If there's a question for Mr. Robbins, yes. Oh, any any uh, thoughts in retrospect over the last half century? Things you might have done differently that day that could have saved history or changed it in any way? No, I was perfect that day. <laughs> As you have been today. Oh yeah. Thank you. That's this is wonderful. Please join me in thanking Rusty Robbins for being here and sharing his story with us. <laughs>